Yeah, so I, uh, I guess uh, just first a little bit about me for those of you who don't know me, I'm, um, I'm a graduate student in computer vision uh, at Caltech and I work with Pietro Perona and I've been working for actually like an obscenely long time, like since undergrad on um, sort of machine learning for camera traps and the different aspects of that. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of my previous work and some of my current work today. Um, and then I'm excited to discuss with all of you as well. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I think I wanted to start with just sort of a big goal. Um, so I know that, you know, computational sustainability means a lot of things to a lot of people. Um, but uh, for me, sustainability has always um, been very innately tied to conservation. And there's this large goal that many people have had for a long time um, to be able to actually monitor the biodiversity in the world around us um, globally and in real time and also sort of across the entire taxonomic tree. So we'd love to know, you know, what's actually happening to the world around us, um, when is it happening, and, and with that information we might actually be able to start figuring out why things happen. Um, now that's a really big goal. There's obviously a lot of different things that would go into building a system that would be able to do that. Um, so one thing that I try to figure out all the time is, you know, like how can we contribute? How can we as computational scientists um, use our skill sets to help further some of these really big goals? Um, so I've, most of my work's been focused on sort of this one specific data stream, um, and that's camera traps. So camera traps, uh, I've got an example of one over there on the right. Um, they're essentially just these static, very robust cameras that are placed um, out by biologists and ecologists um, and also hunters um, to try to get um, an understanding of the animals that you might see in a particular region and also to monitor that over time. Um, because these cameras are sort of static and they're passively monitoring, a lot of them operate on a motion trigger they can be left out for up to months or even years. Um, and so you actually get sort of a really nice um, temporal consistency where you're sort of seeing how things change throughout seasons or, or even longer. Um, and then on the left, I'm showing just examples from two different, uh, so two different images from the same camera trap. So what you're seeing here is like, you know, you get a lot of variability within camera trap data. Things because a human isn't taking the photos, things can be kind of hard to uh, kind of hard to classify, even for humans. Um, so, to give you a, an idea of the scope of this just single data stream, which is one of many different biodiversity data streams that is out there, um, there are thousands of organizations that are using camera traps, um, tens of thousands of camera trap projects, millions of actual camera traps and hundreds of millions of camera trap images um, that already exist. And that is only scaling up as these sensors become cheaper and easier to operate. Um, and I got all these estimates from Eric Begros, who works for Conservation International. Um, and this is awesome. I mean, the fact that you're able to scale up like this, get this much data is fantastic, but it means you have to be able to process this data. Um, and, and that is where things get tricky. Um, so for example, uh, one of the groups I work with is the Idaho Department of Fish and Game. And when we uh, started working with them, you know, they had five years of unprocessed, unlabeled data. Um, and that was around 5 million images. And they had three people working on the project and they were just going through trying to get as many of those images labeled as they could um, because they need to actually understand, you know, what animals were seen when in order to do their scientific analysis. And this was something that was just they were just never gonna catch up because their data was constantly being collected at a far greater rate than they were able to process it. Um, and part of the problem is that it's, camera trap data is really challenging. So not only is it just, you get a lot of images, but they can be really, really difficult to categorize even for humans. So, you know, because there's not a human taking the photo, they're not like, you know, zooming in and focusing on the animal you care about. Um, you get this weird stuff where you have really bad illumination or the animal's really blurry. The region of interest that the animal you might care about categorizing could be very small in, in the frame of the image. The animals are heavily occluded. Some of them are naturally camouflaged. Um, prey animals, for example, are basically designed to blend in with the background. 
Um, and then you sometimes get these really odd perspectives because there's sort of no guarantee that an animal's going to pose for you in the perfect orientation to a camera trap. Um, so every single one of these images have an animal in them. And those animals are hard to find, let alone categorize. Um, and then there's this added dimension of, um, there's a lot of false triggers from camera traps. So up to 70, sometimes even 90% of the images from a single camera trap won't have any animals at all. But if you see here how hard some of these animals are to find, then you kind of start to understand how that makes things really slow in terms of human labeling. Because if you're looking through images, like if there's a big deer in the front, sure, okay, you're like, okay, there's a deer, click. Um, but if you don't see an animal right away, that doesn't mean that there isn't one there. And so actually all those empty images are really slow to go through because you wanna be really careful and make sure that you're not missing important things. Um, and then one of the things that's sort of disappointing about all of this, um, because it seems like a really obvious application for machine learning, you know, we want to be able to just train up a machine learning model and automate this process so that the biologists can spend their time actually doing the data analysis and not just hand labeling hundreds of thousands of images. Um, but what we found in a paper from a couple of years ago is that even though it seems like a machine learning model can be trained to do quite well, if you take that same model and now try to use it on a new camera, so that's a camera that wasn't seen during training, you end up seeing this huge drop off in performance. Um, and, and that was something that hadn't really been captured in previous work, trying to do machine learning for camera trap data. You know, people were reporting things like 97% accuracy, but they were reporting it on the locations of the cameras that they'd already trained on. And this generalization problem is one that's really vital for us to tackle if we want this to be able to actually scale up globally, because ideally you don't want to actually have to collect training data for every single camera that you place in the wild. So um, what we did find is that um, class agnostic detection algorithms tended to generalize best. Um, so let me see if I can get this video to play. Maybe. There we go. Um, so what that means is essentially if you don't actually force a detection algorithm to be class specific, instead you just let it learn the class animal, then there's enough sort of variability across the scope of all of the images you train on representing what animals might be, that it actually seems to be able to then understand finding animals at new camera trap locations, um, which, is, which is, I think, uh, really interesting and also really useful because we find that this actually does a pretty good job. Um, so this can actually remove all of those empty images that were a big problem for a lot of uh, biologists that we were facing. Um, and then, so by taking this, one thing that we sort of currently basically just suggest that people do is since we know that if you train a machine learning algorithm on the camera traps you actually care about, um, that it will actually do pretty well for the rest of those images. So one thing that you can do just, just now, based on the data that you have, is you can take this class agnostic detector and use it as weak bounding box labels and then match those to image level uh, species labels. Um, and, then, and then you can use that in combination to either fine tune a class specific detector or to, um, or to actually you know, just classify only the things that are found by the bounding box. Um, and what we actually use this with the Idaho Department of Fish and Game, and we're using it with, I think, 16 other organizations currently. And we were able to sort through their 4.8 million images um, in just a couple of days. And this would taken 10 people 40 weeks to complete um, by their estimation. So that's already like a huge reduction in, um, in the amount of effort, human effort, that goes into processing this data. Um, but then, so going back here again, and I, I didn't explain this plot very well, I got a bit distracted. Um, but what we, what we see here is that the blue line is um, cis locations, so locations that you are the same as the locations you've seen during training, and the red ones are trans, locations that are different from what you've seen during training. Um, and so what you see is this big, big boost in error from these cis locations to the trans locations. Um, but you also see this really consistent trend, which is that basically rare classes are hard. Uh, animals that you don't have sufficient data, training data for are do worse across the board. Um, and you can kind of see here, like if you wanted to do 
accuracy, which isn't maybe even good enough for most biologists, but is you know, a, a reasonable bar to set at first. Um, you'd need 100 images from cis locations, but maybe you know, thousands from, from locations you hadn't seen. Um, and this is a problem when you think about the distribution of animals in the world. So this is a plot that I, um, I generated using iNaturalist data. Um, so Naturalist is a, a citizen science platform where people go out into the world and take images of plants and animals. And, um, and then, you know, people in my lab in the past have trained up machine learning models um, to predict the species in these images. Um, but we see that same problem. And if you look at the distribution of these species, you see that the, the natural world just exhibits a long tail distribution. You know, there's maybe 10,000 species that have 100 observations, but then there's an order of magnitude more that have sort of not enough to be able to cat be categorized accurately by a machine learning model. Um, and this is kind of just pointing to that our machine learning models aren't very data efficient, which is something that I think many people know. Um, because a human is able to learn a new species from with three to seven photos. So they really don't need a hundred photos to understand a separate species. Um, and I think that that, you know, that 10x data gap is, is something that we really need to be working to close to try to make our machine learning models more data efficient. Um, one hypothesis for why this is, is, is pose variability. Um, humans have a really geometric way of thinking. So it's very easy for us to see an image of a bird and, and imagine what that bird might look like at a different pose. Um, but a machine learning model doesn't necessarily have that same built-in um, geometric ability. And so what you end up needing is you end up needing sort of representations of across the space of poses that a certain species might exhibit in order to understand what that species looks at, looks like um, at those different poses. And so if you don't have enough data, then you kind of just don't have enough variability in position or, or you know, lighting or, or what have you to be able to understand just a general representation of that species. Um, but that's actually even more of a problem for camera trap data because camera traps are static and objects of interest are habitual. So these two images were taken a month apart. Um, you can see that, you know, for a camera trap, like you end up getting kind of repetition, not only in the background pixels, but actually in the the representations of the species that you might see, because these animals are doing the same things over and over and over again. And so you can kind of think of this as just like, camera traps are, have low sample efficiency. For every image you get at a camera trap, it doesn't necessarily have the same value as an image that would be independently collected from that. Um, so when we talk about the amount of data we have for camera traps, it's almost like we need to be talking about camera locations instead of the number of images. Because if you just look at trying to come up with like a set number of camera trap images. Um, if all of those images are from one camera trap, you might not be able to generalize at all, even if you have hundreds of thousands of images of a species from that single trap. Um, and so one thing that we did try to do to try to fight this problem, because if you imagine, if you have a species that has a few examples, then, and all of them are from the same camera, then really you just don't have any variability. Um, uh, so we actually wrote a paper that came out earlier this year where we use synthetic data, um, a, different, a few different types of synthetic data, either generally generated by a gaming engine or just um, doing it in sort of naive ways by taking, you know, real examples of rare classes and adding them to different backgrounds to generate sort of synthetic additional imagery for those classes. Um, and what we found is that by, you know, generating this additional training data, as long as it was, you know, significantly different from what you saw sort of in your original training set and if it had as much variability as possible you could in fact like half the error on that rare class but of course this is something that um you know there's a trade-off in terms of the effort required to create the data so if you're potentially studying a rare species and you care really a lot about that specific species in your set it might make sense to put in the effort to create this synthetic data but um but it's it's not like hitting a button and, and go at this point. Um, there is some really interesting work that's been coming out of like Angdu Sawa's lab, um, where she's actually going from images to uh, three-dimensional models. And then so potentially you could connect all these dots together where, where you could develop a three-dimensional model without actually having to employ a graphics artist. Um, and so potentially down the road, this could be uh, really valuable. But for now, it seems like it's still kind of a lot of effort um, for the payoff. 
Um, but let's go back to this, because this was something that for probably two or three years I saw as a huge detriment. I was like, ugh, like it's just so hard to get enough training data that's variable enough to actually train a machine learning model to do well here because of this consistency across one location. Um, but then as I was working with human biologists, I realized that for humans, this consistency is constantly being used. The humans are actually leveraging the fact that there is temporal consistency to do better on the hard examples from a single location. So I'll give you an example. It might be kind of hard to see. So hopefully, hopefully this is all right. Um, but yeah, so here's a camera trap image. I don't think any of us know from just this what's going on here. I, I don't know if there's an animal or not. Um, so if I was a human um, biologist, I would look at this image and I'd be like, okay, not really sure what's going on here. Let's look at, let's click back and forth, look at some of the other data in this camera trap. Um, so they might see this and they're like, oh, okay. Uh, there looks like there's something here. Um, kind of might be the leg of an animal. And we'll see in this other image, there's kind of like this ghosty thing that might be like the blurry leg of an animal in a similar place, but we're not totally sure yet. But here we see sort of other blurry ghosty legs. And so now it becomes a little more like, okay, probably some sort of antelope species or something is walking in front of this camera. But it's pretty hard to figure out what the species is. But then in a but we are pretty sure that there is actually something there. Um, and then in a later image, we actually get this photo, which has the face of an animal. And based on sort of that, the, how habitual these animals are, most biologists would actually use this to help categorize all of, the, all of those. And so every single one of these things gets to be sort of information gets to be shared across all of them from a human perspective. Um, so yeah. Cool, now we have you know, four examples of Impala instead of uh, maybe only one of them that a machine learning model would have been able to categorize. Um, so human practitioners use this information. Can we build machine learning models that can do the same? Um, and so that, that's what we focused on in our most recent work. And I'm gonna spend most of the rest of the presentation just going through some of the details of that. Um, so there's two things we wanna be able to do. We want to be able to both improve this per location object classification and object detection. Um, and so if you know, we know that one of these is one species, then it should be pretty clear that the other one is the same. Um, so we wanna be able to share information across time and not just across you know, a very short time window, but actually these were a month apart. We wanna share that information up to a month or, or more, up to years. Um, and then the other consistent problem is that you go to a new camera trap and you'll have maybe a salient object that looks kind of like it might be an animal. And then you end up getting these really repetitive false positives that are a huge pain in the butt for any biologist where you're just saying again and again and again that this rock is an animal. So we'd really like to be able to share the information there as well and reduce the number of those false positives. Um, so our strategy for doing this is, was to do sort of a two pass system where we first built up um, a sort of a contextual memory bank. We said, okay, if you wanna take, you know, you got a month, a new month of data, I wanna just extract some contextual representations of each of those images. Um, and I wanna do this sort of offline with something that's completely frozen that doesn't need any retraining for a new camera location, something that you can just use. And so we've, we've tried this for a few different things. Um, we've tried uh, training feature extractors on camera trap data. We've also done it just using data from COCA, uh, machine learning models trained on COCA. And we found that as long as it's sort of visually representative, it actually still is beneficial, though you get the most benefit from sort of a, a model that's trained on camera trap data and ideally camera trap data covering the species that you're interested in. Um, and then what we do is you just take um, essentially the features that come out of a faster RCNN model within certain objects of interest. And then we reduce the feature size by, you know, pooling across the spatial dimension um, and we kind of curate them. So instead of taking all of the boxes that come out of faster RCNN for every image, we just take, you know, either the most confident one or only ones that are of high confidence. Um, and the other thing that we do is we maintain the spatial temporal information for these objects. So we, we remember sort of where in the image frame the object was and also what time the photo was taken. Um, and then we use attention to incorporate that contextual information. Um, attention has been 
uh, is a very powerful tool that's been uh, pretty widely used both in natural language processing and, and recently has been just taking the world of computer vision by storm. Um, but what we do is we essentially, I don't, know, uh, I don't know how familiar you guys are with object detection. I mean, most object detection, there's sort of, there's these two stage object detection networks that work quite well. And what happens there is it goes through this, an image goes through a first stage and a bunch of objects are proposed. So you get essentially just a bunch of boxes around things the model thinks might be objects of interest. And then you pass it through a second stage. And in that second stage, it tries to classify the objects in each of those boxes. And so what we do is we just inject this contextual information in between those two, um, these two stages. So you take all those proposed objects, you, um, you pass them through an attention block that lets them look into that contextual memory bank and extract the information that it's sort of most relevant to, the boxes in, to that box in question. And then it aggregates that information and then categorizes. Um, and I mean, this is like a bit, a bit uh, complicated, but I, I was trying to just show that actually the attention itself is pretty simple. Um, so you're just mapping into a new space. You're essentially just doing matrix multiplication to get a similarity score in that new embedded space. And then you're using taking a soft max to turn that into a set of weights. And then you're using those weights to sum up over the different features in the context in the contextual memory bank. Um, so the math of it actually is quite simple and quite efficient. Um, so this is just looking at, you know, I, I was saying like this is something that has been really popular lately and it's been shown to be really valuable um, time and time again in, in vision in the last year. Um, so sort of concurrently with the work that we were doing, a lot of people were applying this to, um, to video. Uh, potentially not with, you know, up to months of data and um, and not sort of incorporating some of the sort of false positive reduction that we were doing, but um, sort of very similar using self-attention to try to aggregate information over time. And it's been shown to be pretty valuable in all of these papers, in ours, and, and um, there's been, you know, probably 20, 30 more papers since uh, ours was released that have done similar things. Um, so we applied this to three different data sets. Um, two of them are camera trap data sets from pretty different regions of the world. So one is Snapshot Serengeti, which is pretty widely understood and used. And it's a very large data set um, covering, I think, up to 10 years now. We just took the first six seasons. Um, it covers 48 classes in the Serengeti. And um, it's around 200, it's 225 camera locations. And what we did is we, um, in all of these cases, we split up the camera locations into train and test locations. So the evaluations you're getting are com on completely unseen camera locations, um, things that you haven't seen during training. We also applied it to Caltech Camera Traps, which is a data set I released a couple of years ago. That's all data from the American Southwest and is sort of very different type of camera trap data. You, you get uh, a lot more sort of urban suburban environments. Um, and then we also applied this to traffic cameras because we were curious whether it was sort of, you could see a consistent um, boost in, across not just you know camera trap static cameras, but just other types of static cameras in general. Um, and we saw you know some pretty serious boosts in in precision and also boosts in recall. So um, I was I was very pleasantly surprised. But you know on Caltech camera traps, this is like a almost a nineteen percent improvement, um, and that's absolute improvement. And in snapshot Serengeti, it was seventeen. Um, and then in city cam, it was like close to five, so a little bit less. Um, our thought as to why the camera traps actually benefit so much more from this is that that habituosity of the animals. So, um, and also kind of the herd mentality. So if you have like an animal that is um, in a herd, for example, the their shared information across um, the objects within an image, as well as into you know into the past, and so you're you're able to kind of understand that that thing that's very far in the back is probably also the same species as the rest of the animals in the herd, and some of them might be easier to categorize. Um, and what we saw was that our intuition was kind of correct. So we really were improving predominantly on the challenging cases. So here the blue boxes are boxes that both models got correct. And on the left is the single frame model where you just get one image at a time. And on the right is our model that has this contextual attention. Um, and the green ones are objects that we categorized correctly that the single frame model missed entirely. And then the red ones are objects that we um, correctly did not categorize as an object. Um, whereas the single frame model 
sort of that significant um, salient false positive thing would predict that over and over again. Um, and uh, what we also find is that the attention, um, the nice thing about it is it's just very, uh, it's very adaptive. So instead of setting up like a set of heuristics, like, okay, you're going to look five frames ahead and five frames behind and try to like do some smart average or something over the types of animals you see. What we find is that it really can just look across all of the data and extract the things that are most important, kind of regardless of where they happened in time. So in the case of this warthog, it's taking frames really dispersed throughout the month. Um, and you can see that warthog really liked running back and forth on that trail. And so, okay, cool. And it aggregates all that information and categorizes each of them with higher confidence. Whereas in the case of this gazelle, you have a Thompson's gazelle that's just hanging out in front of the camera. And it basically just aggregates information um, from that same instance of the gazelle because it's sort of the most uh, visually similar and, and sort of the most uh, informative when you're trying to actually categorize that specific animal. Um, and what we also saw is that uh, it's not like it only improves on common classes. So we, we, we see improvement across the board. I mean, every single class improve, improved a little bit, except for rhinoceroses, which just were never predicted ever, but there was only like two training images. So that's kind of not surprising. Um, and, you know, you still see this kind of trend where images that have fewer training examples still do worse, but we think it's really promising that we're seeing sort of, you know, if you just almost consistent um, average at around, you know, 20% improvement. Um, and the other cool thing we found is that the model, so like we we're saying, like removing those false positives, the model is actually learning background classes without supervision. So it will sort of find bushes across a front, an image and, and aggregate attention across these different bushes or or find rocks and aggregate attention across these different rocks. And so it seems to be sort of learning visual representations of what background classes are without us ever actually explicitly supervising that this is a bush and this is a rock and you should ignore these things. Um, and so I kind of wanted to finish by just uh, talking about, like I'm excited about uh, both how well this is working, but also there's a lot of different static passive monitoring sensors that are used in conservation and in many other fields. Um, so audio moth, moth are these static um, uh, audio sensors that people use to study, you know, audio trackable species like insects or birds or, um, you know, different things that vocalize. And this ARIS, um, there are static sonar systems that are used to study and count fish populations. And there are many more. Um, but so all of these kind of have these similar difficulties, these sparse irregular frame rates, um, there's power computation and memory constraints, so the image quality is not always great or the data quality, and a lot of the data is sort of empty. There's a lot of sort of background noise and things that are sort of biased and specific to that individual sensor location. And um, so I'm excited. I've, I have some collaborations going right now where we're trying to take the same type of attention-based approach and apply it in these very different data streams. Um, and that kind of brings me uh, just to like wrap up. Um, we're talking about how can we contribute, and I've been thinking about this a lot lately, and I actually think that, um, especially as all these data streams become de-siloed and more and more accessible, I think that some of the coolest things that we as computational scientists or data scientists can do is come up with intelligent ways to combine those data streams. So, you know, we have access to all of these different types of data, and there's not really a good way that we know of so far to combine them because they're, they're across different temporal scales or spatial resolutions. Um, but I actually think that given, given like the magnitude of what we're trying to do, being able to aggregate information instead of trying to come up with models from each separate data stream that are accurate and aggregating them there, I think is kind of maybe the way forward. And so um, kind of along those lines, um, there's actually two uh, biodiversity focused AI competitions that are going right now. Um, so one of them is this iWildCam competition and it's the third year that I've been running that competition at CEPR. Um, and then there's this other one that's a uh, GeoLife Clay and that one's based on um, trying to build species distribution models from just uh, occurrence data. And in both of these cases, you actually are looking at this kind of multimodal data approach. So for this year's iWildCam, we provided um, satellite data for every single camera trap where you can kind of, hopefully we can see that by aggregating the sort of satellite data with the camera trap data, we can improve our species ID. Um, and then the GeoLife Clay one, 
they have both the species observations plus remote sensing, plus also um, different types of uh, features from the environment and things like weather. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to thank the many, many people and organizations who have helped me do all this work. Um, and uh, yeah, I'd, I'd love to discuss with all of you. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, hi, Rachel. Hi, how's it going? Um, I'm just curious if any other fish and game departments have uh, reached out to you about, um, you know, utilizing this, this program that Idaho has used. Um, yeah, so uh, what Idaho, Idaho has been working directly with my collaborators at um, Microsoft AI for Earth. And um, I'd have to check with Dan Morris, right, um, what the status is right now. Um, I know that the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, I think, is what they're called. Um, they're um, interested and they're working right now to start working with Wildlife Insights, which is another organization that I'm involved with. And Wildlife Insights is trying to provide kind of a really easy to use for like sort of not necessarily um, computer science uh, people, a data management system for camera traps that has computer vision in the back end. And so I'm on their AI team and we're working on incorporating uh, the models I just presented into that platform. Um, and I know that the sort of the whole state of California is planning to use that platform. Um, and it's becoming slowly publicly available. Right now it's available to whitelisted um, users. And that's basically just to do a scalability. Um, I think we're also working with Alaska with Microsoft as well. Um, but yeah, I, I can't tell you at the top of my head. But if you are interested, please let me know and I can connect you to people who will help you batch run all your data through this nice machine learning model and visualize your results in time lapse, which is like a nice camera trap uh, management software. And so it's all pretty accessible, but I think it still does need just like a little bit of um, computer science how to, which we're happy to provide, but yeah. Thanks. Anyone else? Hi, Sarah. Uh, Hi. This is Rinzen from Canada. And um, thanks for a wonderful presentation. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Uh, uh, you know, I have been uh, wondering about, because I'm working on snow leopards and I've got, uh, uh, I would say, a significant number of uh, camera trap images of snow leopards from uh, Bhutan and Nepal. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, we did, did our survey back in 2012. Then it took me around six months just to go through those images, sort out uh, the pulse images, and identify in, uh, individual snow leopards. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but I'm really amazed by the possibility that you have uh, s uh, shown in this presentation. Uh, so my question to you is, uh, you know, um, sorry about this. Uh, uh, if the machine learning algorithm, if, if you know, has uh, using the, uh, this algorithm, we can identify in individual an animals. Oh, um, so as it stands right now, um, the model that I just showed, it's just doing species ID. But I, I work really directly with a group called WildMe, and they do individual identification for a lot of different species. And spotted um, leopards is definitely included in that. Um, and we're interested in actually incorporating this attention across camera trap images for individual ID. Um, and so we're working on trying to add in that capability. It seems like um, kind of there's two challenges with that. So a lot of their um, pipelines for individual identification are based on human captured photos. So they're sort of guaranteed a certain amount of uh, data quality. And so one thing that we have to kind of figure out is, you know, based on camera trap data, how, how good does the image have to be to be able to be individually identified? Um, because, yeah, I, I think that, you know, there, there are some cases where humans can't even identify because the animal is too blurry or something. Um, and then the other challenge is that because a lot of these individual identification models are based on features, um, so that's good because it's not sort of a deep learning approach and it allows for uh, handling the open setness of a population of animals. Um, but what that does mean is in a camera trap, you'll end up matching those background features over and over and over again. Like those are going to be really strongly matched. And so I think to be able to do, to use their current systems for individual identification, I think we actually need to do segmentation for those animals of interest. Um, so 
but it seems to me like actually a pretty straightforward extension of this work um, to doing segmentation with attention. Um, a lot of the segmentation algorithms are actually sort of built on top of these two stage detection pipelines anyway, where they just pass masks instead of boxes. Um, so I, it's one of the things that I'm uh, working on with my collaborators at Google right now is trying to figure out if we can extend this to segmentation and if we can do that in a weekly supervised way so we don't have to collect millions of segmentation labels. Oh, sounds great, thanks. Uh, but you know, uh, perhaps we could collaborate, collaborate on this because we have did some population, uh, you know, statistical modeling of um, snow leopard populations based on camera trap data. And I'm just wondering if, you know, we could verify the results from um, machine learning uh, versus, uh, you know, human identities, how the accuracy or, uh, you know, the precision, how uh, it changes, Absolutely. how sensitive it is. Yeah, so uh, that'll be really great, I guess. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, any, it's, it's actually really difficult to get individual labeled data. Um, that's one of the biggest problems with it. Um, and so if you, if you have data with individual IDs that you'd be willing to share with us to use for verification, we would be super happy. Um, so yeah, please uh, reach out. Um, I can maybe ping you my email or something. Oh, or that, uh, that, yeah, yeah but I must, I'll really appreciate that. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. Any other questions? Presentation. So uh, I briefly uh, look at your uh, paper. It was amazing. But it feels like there are a couple of challenges you're trying to uh, list it at the first part. And uh, I have no idea if your attention model, uh, you know, have uh, solved any of them or just specifically uh, animals. Like, like, for example, you, you mentioned uh, like object far from the camera, like object poorly led and uh, background distractors. Uh, does your uh, attention model uh, get any help on that, or it just specifically for the data set you, you are studying on? Um, so, so these are examples of like some of those exact cases where our model did solve those problems. So, um, in in example A, we've got something where the the object of interest is pretty occluded, and it was still able to find it. Um, object B again highly occluded behind the tree, and it was able to find that that elephant and properly categorize it. Okay. Um, and this one, the animal was, this second monkey was pretty far from the camera and um, again, categorized correctly. Here's an example of really poorly lit um, images and it did well on those. Um, so I think that it seems like it's moving in the right direction. I would definitely not say that this, this is like waving a magic wand and all of our problems are solved and now we can just use machine learning without any human in the loop or, at all. But I am really excited to see that some of these challenging cases are being addressed. Okay. Um, uh, and I think actually a huge part of just any machine learning for science um, is this verifiability aspect, especially when we're talking about generalization, which is something that really goes outside the scope of what most machine learning models are designed for. Um, and so I think that there's a huge need for human in the loop verification sort of constantly. Um, if we're going to be using machine learning models in a pipeline that's going to be deciding sort of you know, making, uh, making scientific understanding that's used then for science policy or used to understand whether or not species are endangered, I think it, it's very important that we um, try to use humans intelligently, but try to constantly verify our models so that we can get some, sort, some sense of confidence intervals and, okay. and understand sort of when we should or should not trust the results. Okay. Yeah, basically, I'm located at uh, UC, UC Santa Barbara, and uh, we, uh -huh. have, we also have- I'm actually, I'm living in Lombok right now. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah, yeah. I come from here. So basically, we have a uh, project also uh, based on the, uh, you know, camera trap. We deploy, uh, you know, a couple of them in the, in the Cedric, just like 100 miles north from here. And mm -hmm. we have um, also have years of, you know, uh, videos and images taken from the camera, but with, you know, without labeling. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, we're trying to work on that as well. We use uh, the synthetic data you mentioned. Uh, there's a project called Where's the Bear? So we, yeah. we, we synthesize the, the bear's, uh, you know, pic, picture with the background from the, you know, from the picture and we, uh, in like copy and paste, uh, yeah, you know, exactly. the bears and black bears, you know, yeah. on, on, all the, on all this, uh, you know, background and trying to train the model and trying to do the classification on, uh, on, on the image, on, 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 you know, taken from the camera. That, that was good, but we're still uh, working on that. But basically you, 
we'll definitely go further on that and uh, you know do, doing a great job. And yeah. uh, well, for, so for the attention uh, mechanisms, could you give me some uh, like uh, intuitive um, like interpretation of why does that help? Because basically, uh, you know, seven challenges uh, you, you, you mentioned here, you know, in my perspective, it doesn't really have anything to do with attention because when you have attention, you probably focus on some specific object um, you, know, you already have, but it seems like you have something like object moving out of the frame and some, and, and some object really far from there. If you have attention focus on the object you already have, then how do you detect, you know, another one which are far from, far from the camera? Yeah, so, um, so one thing that's important to point out is that we're doing this attention across all of the proposed boxes that come out of the first stage. Um, so we're not just doing attention for the ones that we're highly confident about. Um, so usually you set up a, a two-stage detection system and after the first stage, it'll produce X boxes where X is generally on the order of like 100, sometimes only even 300. So it's finding like 300 different proposal objects. And then we're doing attention for every single one of those. And so what ends up happening is um, really what you're doing is in a lot of these cases, you do actually find all of the things you care about. It's just that the classification confidence for those objects is very low. And so what this is doing is you have this feature representing this object and then you're pulling in information from all these other things and that helps it boost up that classification performance in the second stage. Okay. So it's pulling information from sort of easier examples to help you categorize the hard ones. Okay, got it. Yeah, I, yeah, I think that's very, uh, yeah, that, yeah that, that, that makes sense. Okay, cool. thank you very much. I really enjoyed that. Yeah, and um, so this code, I've been working really hard to open source this code out of Google. It's a, it's a new experience for me. It turns out that there's like a lot of like, red tape involved. It's a lot more complicated than me just open sourcing my code. Um, but uh, hopefully it will be public soon. Um, and it's just actually going to be supported as an additional model within the TensorFlow Object Detection API, which is one something that everyone sort of uses and is very familiar with the inputs and outputs. So it okay. should be as easy as just sort of using our like contextual memory pre-processing code and then just running it through uh, and training it just like you would train a normal object detector. In well, I'd be so glad uh, to, to see open source that. Actually, uh, what's the name of the repo? Um, so the TensorFlow Object Detection API is, um, yeah, it's just a very well-maintained object detection um, code base. And it's what, uh, it's what Microsoft AI for Earth uses um, for all of our open source models there. And uh, yeah, and, and many, many other people use it. Okay, okay. I, so, uh, hmm? okay so, so your project will be integrated into the TensorFlow uh, Object Detection API. Is that yep. what oh, Yeah, okay. so it's just gonna be an additional architecture option where you oh. can just say, you know, you point to it in your configuration file instead of pointing to faster RCNN, you can point to context RCNN, which is what we're calling this. Awesome, Great. awesome, <laughs> that'd, be, that'd be really nice. Thank you, thank you very much. Yeah, no problem. Does anyone have any other questions? So if nobody has any question, uh, thank you so much, Sarah, for the great presentation. And